Greetings all. Um, a warm welcome to the Conflict Done Well Dojo. Uh, while you are here, please participate in a way that works well for you and care for yourself and the group by taking responsibility for your choices. If something we do doesn't meet your needs, please change your circumstances quietly or interrupt to describe what is happening and make a proposal. So my intention is to use all or parts of the recording of this session to promote my work and help others with their learning. If anybody would like that to change now or in the future, just let me know. Um, is there anything anyone needs to say right now to arrive in the present and be ready to train together? Happy to be there. Ah, that's the first thing that comes to mind is I wish I had someone's body. Wish they could. Wish they could. Grab on me, you know, and I could fall down. I have one, what you see behind me, what you see behind me is Matt. So I've, I've given myself a little bit of surface to move on and roll on um, by putting mats on my back porch. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not expecting there's going to be a whole lot of uh, ukemi in this particular session. So I thought I would just... Uh, uh, I'll give you a brief introduction and then ask about questions and then we'll jump right into some exercises. So the difference between conflict done well and conflict done poorly, in my experience, um, has to do with the process and also has to do with the result. Um, the process is different from conflict uh, of the usual sort because we're, tra we're treating all instances of conflict of me being different from you as an opportunity to train to get better at conflict itself so that next time we get better results, rather than sort of just enduring the conflict until it ends or taking it as an opportunity to dominate other people to, to make them do what we want. We're um, not resolving to be nice. We're not resolving anything. We're arriving, or admitting that we're different, getting specific about how that is, and then negotiating about what might happen next. So the first step is always description, rather whether it's in my head or verbal, describing what's happening. And I'll take turns and you'll take turns, um, followed by proposals. So it's basically a two-step process that gets complicated depending on how you execute the two steps, description and proposal. Um, the, that's the process difference. The result different is, difference is that you'll, you'll know you've done conflict well when um, the people involved report to each other how it was as though that is something we could talk about and in reporting how it was um, it's better for them than if we had done conflict the usual way um, not making not making agreements not describing things not making proposals but just sort of doing whatever and then the stopping at some point and that being the way things are going to be for the future so um, does anybody have any questions so far is there anything they would like to say that's brief I am not hearing your voice, Jack. It's possible that you're still muted. So what you're describing, is this basically a verbal process, huh? Um, it is, that, that is the verbal part of the process. And then what Conflict Done Well does is it um, practices that with physical um, aspects. So it will look during some, at some points, uh, more like a silent verbal choice with a physical movement is what a lot of people would expect when they see Aikido um, or Jiu Jitsu, depending on the kind of conflict we're having. Um, and then there is a part where we speak and we move at the same time or, or very closely interspersed. And then there are, uh, are conflicts in which we choose to speak only and to be very still with our bodies, either standing together, standing facing each other. The challenge uh, of responding to a real conflict in real time is to be able to have what Aikido refers to as takemusu, where it arises, the choice of technique arises from within the conflict itself and is fitted and natural to the movement and choices being made. It will look to some parts of our process, look to some people like uh, a facilitation opportunity, like they might have had some other place that looks like that. And parts of our process look like theater there's a performance or a demonstration going on of something in which people are participating. And some parts of our process look like um, meditation um, or uh, moving meditation or the structural learning that makes your body 
and your mind and your communication all work together because you've done the bits of it and then run it all together and done the bits of it again and run it all together so that you can pay attention to the various levels that are going on and you can also run them <coughs> in whatever order seems appropriate. For instance, if you speak to me first, I wouldn't immediately stick my hand out for you to grab it. If you speak to me, I might respond to you with words. I also might take a little bit of distance with my body and respond with words in, in sequence, or I might do it all at the same time. And the challenge is to be able to do all the parts with people who are interested in you helping your learning because you're also interested in helping their learning so that that expectation, that somatic expectation that affects your entire body, mind, spirit, soul, all the words we use to describe ourselves, but somatic being the whole view of that process, so that you're ready to respond, which is the core metaphor of all martial arts um, of all communication, is that you're wanting to be read. And the metaphor of all martial arts is that you're wanting to be read. Does that make sense? Anything else that needs? Oh, please. Christian. Um, we all know that to, it takes time for the body to learn, yes, more than the mind. So there is a kind of disconnection in the timing. So how do you see your pedagogical approach for just teaching to people without having them to practice for years on the mat? My, my approach, oh, I, let me give a couple of answers to that question. Um, one is that sometimes the body is fast and the mind is slow. And sometimes the mind is fast and the body is slow. And so um, the pedagogical approach uh, to conflict done well, for in conflict done well, is again, we return to description, either silently to yourself or shared with other people. And if what's happening is a slowness of one part of the process compared to the other part of the process, then what we would be looking for is a way to exercise in a way that stretches, makes the faster go slow, the slower go fast, makes them relate to each other so they move together. And we often use, um, uh, I won't use the Japanese terms for it. We often use timing as, as um, uh, timing exercises to figure out for you, what is it like when X happens? Does your brain speed up and your body slow down? Does your body speed up and your brain slow down? And how do you get those talking to each other so that the wheels mesh and the gears turn together when you need them to be unified? So we identify the problem through description and then we directly um, propose exercises that are related to the thing we're working on. And then we do our best to let go of that as a concern. Because if you're worried about how fast everything works, you can't, you can't respond at optimal level um, because you're worried about it. You're spending your exercise worrying about how it's going to be rather than just being the response. Does that make sense? So identify it, propose an exercise about it, and then do it yourself or bring it in front of other people. Work it, to, work it solo or work it as a group. Um, and each exercise is designed to, to work on the concepts of conflict done well as a whole, um, which is a system called martial nonviolence. That's what I've called it for years. Um, and um, I call, for Aikidoists, I call it Aikido 2.0, so I can be really clear that I'm aligning with the original Aikido principles, but that I'm asking for Aikido to make a transition itself to really respond to the founder's explicit desire that we work in the world uh, considerably beyond becoming uh, martially proficient and being able to throw somebody else down. I, I, I'm paraphrasing his words, but he said the point is not to be able to throw people down hard, it's to be able to make the world one family, I believe was his instruction. And it wasn't, it wasn't a casual thought on his part. It was his reason for moving from jujitsu to Aikido, calling it that, and excerpting the parts of the, of the jujitsu in which he was always expert to be directly related to circularity, receptivity, movement, and preservation of the attacker, which is a complete flip of um, the outcome of the jujitsu expects. I'm also, um, I have a predilection for long, very wordy responses. And if I, if I talk to the point that your question has been answered and you realize I'm either repeating myself or going on to something else that you're not interested in, just put up your hand. And I, I might not even need to call on you. I might go, okay, right, I'm probably going on too long. Or you could just do that. Because I, I, need, I, need, I need help knowing when to stop sometimes because I'm so engaged with this material. Mm -hmm. 
Anything else that needs to be said before we move on? Lovely. All right. Let's see if we have anybody else joining us. I haven't seen anybody. Uh, yay. I see Ria and I see Rochelle. Would either of you like to say anything to introduce yourself or to arrive and be present? Uh, did you hear a little bit about what I said about how we do what we do? I did. I heard everything. And Rochelle is my colleague. And we work with folks who are um, often nonverbal and can be engaged in assaultive behaviors because they're having a challenging moment. So this training is particularly resonant for us. So thank you. Excellent. Okay. I Please totally agree. Okay. I can't see everybody at the same time. I can see four people at a time on, on this interface that I'm using. I'm using a pad that I'm looking at right now. And this is a laptop that's pointed toward my feet because I'm going to be giving examples. And I'm going to ask you to take a little bit of space so that you can stand up and move around, even if it's in just three or four feet of space. So if you'd like to, if you'd like to make yourself a tiny bit of space to be able to stand up and sit down and move around a little bit, now would be the time to do that. Oh, Jesus. Oh, wait, I'm not on there. Hi, Michelle. And hey, my friend. Sorry. Hey. So we're going to move just a little bit. And you can move in your chair or you can move standing. But the, the point, um, we begin our sessions in person with um, a combination of exercises that are drawn mostly from yoga and my uh, Aikido experience and then jujitsu exercises, which are all about structuring your body so that it supports itself rather than isolating bits, so that you move with internal strength rather than individual strength with your arm or your leg. Um, and what I'd like to ask you to remember is that every part of what we do, the purpose of it is to join the physical experience of what you're doing with the metaphorical or psychological experience of what you're doing. So can you hear my voice still? Yes, okay. So as we move our bodies, um, you are giving a message to your body as witness and to other people um, about uh, what they should understand about the process in the same way that this is a message. And it's also this far from my body. This is the message. This is a different message. This is a different message. And what you do with your body directly relates to, um, to someone else and uh, their understanding of what's happening. And they immediately begin to respond to you unconsciously, whether they know it or not. So um, when I deal with clients under extreme stress, especially when I'm teaching first responders and people that are, in that are um, their purpose is to work with crisis, is that the job is to balance and center yourself while affecting the other person so that you can then make proposals for what will happen next that are good for everybody. Because those, that, the three parts of that process um, align you with them in ways that they aren't able to completely process. And when they're under stress, whether they're attacking you or they look very nervous or whatever, your balancing yourself changes them. Your having an effect on them that is positive changes them. And when, you, when they can begin to tell that your intention is for their good, that also draws them into alignment with you. So it's like saying, come with me. It's a circular welcoming thing that you do with your face, your body, um, your whole um, process, your whole somatic experience. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so let me get really close to this camera because it seems to be ready for us. This face is a resting face. Right? This face looks worried. This is the acting part of what we're doing. So imagine yourself as an actor. You're wanting to give your audience a particular experience. Let me try it up here. This face is a resting face. Would everyone do a resting face? Try to relax it as much as possible. Feel the tension in your brow and try to get it to be calm. Yeah. And then this gives people the idea of listening. When you tilt your head and you move your ear toward them, they have a feeling that you're listening to them. You may in fact be getting closer to punch them in the face, but the idea is that you wanna, you wanna understand what kind of message your body is giving so you can give a conscious message rather than just an unconscious one. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so the message you give your body when you stretch uh, let me give an example. 
if we were to if we were to stretch by pulling our legs toward each other by ourselves and pushing our knees down there's this that i see ballet dancers and athletes do a lot and then there's this which gives your body a different kind of whole body understanding and the bouncing I would eschew, I would choose instead the pulling of your heels and the pushing of your knees. If you're sitting in a chair, you can move your hips apart. You can move your hips apart and stretch one leg and then the other and then roll your knees and your toes together so that it changes the position of your hips. Okay. By giving your attention to what the effect of your movement has on you, you are changing your focus from a results oriented, I got to get my knees down to the ground thing to a let's see what happens when I do this kind of experience. It gives space around your intention that transmits to the other person so that they will not see you as having a plan for them. They will simply see you as balancing yourself. It gives, you a, it gives them a sense that you're confident and it gives them a sense that you're paying attention to the process, which you then can turn and give them as a gift. You can pay attention to them because you're able to pay attention to yourself. So step one is to center and balance yourself. If you're standing, please bend your knees over your toes and let your feet be in alignment. And your knees will go over your toes so that rather than, um, rather than having your legs be straight, the bending of the knee lets the body drop. So your body goes straight up and down like a piston and your knee bends a little bit. When someone comes up to you and gives you evidence that there's a conflict happening, if you will bend your knees and allow your hips to come underside and free up your breathing, you are available for whatever they would like to bring to you, whether it's receiving an attack or listening very carefully to what they have to say. And it's very different if you can feel it than straightening your legs and having your butt stick out a little bit so that your legs are not ready to move. One of the core metaphors for all of this work is readiness, whether you're in doing the martial art, a physical martial art, or doing a psychological martial art. Bending the knees, butt underneath. You're gonna lift through the top of your head. Your chin will tuck slightly. Your eyes will go to the horizon and soft focus them so that you can see, you can take in as much information as possible rather than looking at one thing in particular. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Chin tucks slightly. Let your shoulders roll back and drop down and your chest open. You can think of the metaphor open-hearted if you like, because we're using metaphors to join how we think and feel about things with what we do with our body. We'll do that consistently through in conflict done well. So I'll say it one more time. Crown up, eyes out, soft focus, breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth, your chin is slightly tucked, your shoulders roll back and drop down, your chest opens and look for an open-hearted feel. Breathe into your belly, such that with a hand on your front, and everyone can do this, and a hand on your back, if you smoosh on yourself, when you breathe to your belly, it will separate your hands. Let's just take a few totally full breaths with your shoulders dropped and your hips underneath you and your knees bending over your toes and your feet feeling the floor, and breathe so that your belly and your back expand. So your shoulders won't rise much, if any. And then release your hands and let them float. So your hands are going to feel light. As your shoulders drop, your hands might lift up. And one of the messages you can give with your hands is, hang on a second which is not this, like you're gonna push something away, but just that sort of, hey, wait, 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 hang on, there's been a misunderstanding. Does that make sense? So it's not, you're not pushing somebody away, you're dropping your shoulders, you're letting your elbow rotate so it's closer to your body, and you're loosening your fingers and letting your hand, your thumb come toward your hand because it's a really good target for grabbing. So you're gonna to wanna to relax your hands so they're, long, they're loose, and just put them up like you're saying, whoa, whoa, whoa hang on, because that's one message you might wanna give. You also might want to do this, which is less in their, in their space. You might want to put your hands together. When I do this, I, I, I shake them a little bit sometimes so I can feel my jaw move and my shoulders relax. This is a great exercise you can do when you're tense. And listen to the sound your voice makes. We're going to do this just right now together. 
take a deep breath and shake your hands and let it sound like this. You sound as though your jaw is loose because of the movement you're making. And if you don't sound that way, try to get your jaw to loosen a little bit by loose by pushing it down and then relaxing it and pushing it down and then relaxing. And you'll want to feel this shake all the way into your center and down to the floor. Now, in application and circumstances, actually, wait, let me stop for a second. I'm on a roll. Does anyone have anything they need to say or a question they need to ask at this time, or are we all together so far? Everybody with me? I'm hearing silence, so I'm going to keep on going. Okay. The application, the application of this um, in a circumstance in which you feel threatened or you feel attacked or you're concerned about someone's safety or that you just felt the energy spike is um, dropping into your center involves becoming suddenly aware by using your body to become aware of what's really going on around you immediately, right now in the moment. And the habits you have for dropping into your center um, are layered. You have to practice them one at a time to make sure that you understand what each of them is. And the job is to be able to do it like that when someone comes up and starts to raise their finger to give you the, we have a problem gesture. Or, you know, or to reach, for, to reach into your personal space or to suddenly begin to flail, for instance. Some of the clients I've, uh, the, of the clients I've taught deal with people who are not completely in control of their own bodies or choices. And some of the behavioral issues have to do with, well, what do I do when they can just do that suddenly at any moment? And a lot of, a lot of that has to do with your centering practice, not just the amount of time it takes you to do it, which should be very short with practice, but that you are constantly centered without being vigilant or over vigilant, like is associated with PTSD. So the job is to keep the breathing practice going and to feel your feet on the floor and to move around the person that you're concerned about not having control over their behavior as though they might attack you at any moment, but that not being a thing that makes you vigilant and fearful. It's just something you're watching, something you're aware of. Like if you were, at, if you were playing a, 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 a Frisbee, the Frisbee might suddenly come at you at any moment and you know that's part of the game. So you're aware of where the Frisbee is and it's not a fearful thing. So the job is to change your understanding of what's happening so that the fear doesn't live in your body. It's something you notice and consider, but your body is accustomed to balancing itself so that it doesn't spend the majority of its energy acting as though it's afraid. It acts as though it is not because you process the fear somatically with somebody else and you practice what to do when you feel fearful. Is that, is that clearish? Okay, so, so I'm, I'm focusing on the somatic aspects, the whole body, mind, spirit aspect of what we're doing because that's the part that's most frequently neglected. But we also need to pay close attention to what we do with our words and how we speak. So in order to draw a clear line between how we talk and what we do with our bodies, we'll move our bodies when we talk. That's one, one, of, the, one of the combination of things to give us an exercise. So um, could someone um, unmute themselves and give me an example of a situation in which they felt as though they could use better conflict skills, self-defense, uh, something to some kind of response, and give me a scenario. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as working with it in public will not trigger you into a, into a psychological state from which it's difficult for you to recover while you're alone. So please don't trigger yourself, but think of an example of a situation that you found very difficult or, or, or uh, that you, with which you'd like some feedback. Brandon, can you repeat the question? Because my audio cut out, and it, this Absolutely. is so relevant to what Rochelle and I do. So can you repeat the question? I'm looking for a scenario so we can make it personal, immediate, and I can demonstrate um, how the method directly responds to people's actual needs in real time. And we're going to do it by looking at the verbal component and the physical component and getting them in relationship so you, that you'll know that you have options immediately without having to practice for 50 years. And you could also see the benefits of practicing for 50 years. So it'll be immediately relevant and helpful. And it will also um, imply the possibility of becoming a conflict professional 
and being able to do this um, by practicing it for years and years, like you would anything else, violin, psychology, whatever. It's because it's practice that I'm selling. That's the, the ba my base, my win is at the end, if people see conflict as an opportunity to practice conflict, rather than conflict as a survival threat. God. We're gonna take the taboos and we're gonna normalize conflict so we can practice it like it's no big deal. Okay. So I need a scenario from somebody Tell me a story, a brief story, and then we'll address it using conflict done well. Okay, so but our examples, Rochelle, and our, my examples will be extreme. I have a client who's mostly nonverbal, but he knows the word McDonald's. So when we drive by a McDonald's, McDonald's! And if we don't stop or go to the McDonald's, he will reach out and try to... Rhea, you cut out. Um, but yeah, essentially what he does is that he will he will reach out and try to either choke you or grab you and it's right. Driving. Did you hear what she said? I couldn't hear it. I heard that there's a client uh, in the scenario who mm -hmm. is very excited by driving by a McDonald's and if there's not an immediate stop, the, the physical attack is forthcoming. Absolutely. That's it. Um, and is it is it possible to have someone else in the car and have the person in the back seat so they can't come after you while you're driving? Yes. Yes. So, so just to address the safety issue, um, if if you I'm just speaking I'm speaking as a psychologist briefly because I have, I have to speak to the the I have obligations to speak to some of these things and I'm gonna I'm gonna exhaust that and we can go back to my being the conflict done well guy. If you have a client in the vehicle with you, and it's a situation in which it's possible for them to attack you, and you know that's an option, you're not supposed to be driving with them because it can endanger both your lives and you could be charged with negligence under those circumstances. So you really need to make sure that you don't put yourself in a position where someone with repeated documented behavior of a particular kind, if they do that and you created the situation that allowed them to do that, you can be held negligible, depending on what state you're in. But California definitely, Texas not so much, so what, what needs to happen in that circumstance is if we're going to transport the client, they need to be in the back seat with someone else who can help to calm them down if they have one of their episodes. Right. That is definitely our protocol. And I guess that was kind of an extreme example of what you were asking for. So you, um, maybe we can simplify this a little bit. I'm working with uh, my, like, uh, a relative. Who has sure. Issue, yep. Um, who's triggered this by something. Yep, yep. So um, let's break it down. Um, what I'm hearing is that the concern is that um, you, that there wouldn't have been a chance to prepare, and that you have someone who is triggered by something who puts you and them in a life-threatening situation um, without they're they're unconscious about it. They simply act out, and it involves physically coming toward you. Am I hearing that right? Yeah. Okay. So um, under those circumstances, um, I, I would like to suggest a habit that's going to sound, it might sound a little odd at first, but we can try, we can, let, let's start with a physical habit because the most important thing when you're attacked is to immediately do something that is your choice. Because what the attacker wants, whether the attacker is metaphorical or literal, is for them to call the shots and to be able to do whatever they want to you without you being able to interfere. So the most important thing is that you do something that is your choice. It could be nothing, especially in situations where you don't need to let the other person know that you have this capacity. It could be nothing more than just extending the fingers of your hands in a stretch. But I would like to suggest a targeted breathing out. So whatever breath you have in and don't prepare for it, don't like take a deep breath or anything, just kind of casually listen to me. And what I'm gonna ask is that you suddenly breathe out in a column, that you go like you were blowing something off the table or blowing a dandelion. And you wanna feel your belly, not with your hands literally, but from the inside when you do it. So just breathe all the way out now. <sighs> and feel what happens. And then let yourself breathe normally back in. And let yourself relax. And I'm gonna talk for another couple of seconds and then I'm gonna say the word now. And your job is when I say now to breathe out in a column in such a way that your belly pokes out. Go. <sighs> yeah. And then, what you'll look for in your practice is to be able to connect your hand movement 
immediately with your body movement so that you're putting your hands up between you and the person who's coming without thinking about whether the way you're putting them up matters or not. Just get something between you and the other person <laughs> like that. And one of the ways I like to do it is putting out a hand like I'm saying, hang on a second. With my fingertips up, the blade forward, the thumb back a little bit, because again, it's a good target for grabbing. You want to have your fingertips up, your thumb back, and the blade forward. So we're going to do that one a couple of times. So just I'm gonna, I, in the next couple of minutes, when I say now, your job is to Breathe out in a column and put your hand up toward the camera. Now, relax your shoulder. Let the fingertips lift. Let the blade come forward. One more time. Now, okay. And then we would we would install options. Things you would say. Um, now you've done something, and it's your choice to do it. And then you're going, to, you're going to select options and you're going to think, wonder whether that would apply and do well with the person in question. So um, if someone's attacking you and putting your life and their life in danger, your range of options is much wider. You can do almost anything to make sure that no harm comes to you or them right away. And especially where clients are concerned, you want options that are not going to harm them, especially when they have no idea what they're doing a lot of the time. So um, you could say something like, we are going and then continue to drive long enough to get to the side of the road and stop the car so you cannot have the danger of running into something else when you configure it. So what I'm saying is you can lie. You can tell them they're about to get their, their wishes gratified, knowing that it's going to be a problem later, but much less a problem than running into that stoplight of that car or that pedestrian. So the job is to get the vehicle stopped. Making sense? Yeah. We are going. Hang on just a second. Or you could say, I've really got to go to the bathroom. That might get their attention. They might immediately think, you've got to go to the bathroom? And suddenly their attention is on your needing to go to the bathroom. You could also say, quick. Anything you say quick, immediately their attention goes, say, quick. When's the last time you went to McDonald's? And they're thinking about the thing that they like, but they're thinking about it in the context of when the last time they was when. And you can then follow with the escalating questions. It's one way to work energy with people is you can follow to, and how did you eat? And how did it taste? And there can be a series of questions that they need to respond to before they can get to the, and by that time, the car is stopped and you're already at the side of the road. So the challenge is when you're attacked by somebody to immediately propose something after you've described the situation to yourself in your head. We're gonna crash. Look at that. So it goes directly, uh, Aikido does the same thing with, with its body. When you, when the punch comes and you describe the punch, it's a punch, so I put my hands up, that's my description, punch, I put my hands up, and immediately I propose to them with my body, how about if we go that way? And the punch turns into the fall, the throw and the fall. So what you do with your body, describe, which is to say that's what's happening now, and then to propose, how about we go that way, is the same thing you would do to somebody who is endangering your life in a car. So you would breathe out and put your hand toward them while one hand is on the steering wheel, and you would introduce something else to them that's likely to take that person and refocus their direction, to redirect them in a way that does not have the car running into a thing. Is this making sense so far? Absolutely. We call it stimulus change. But I, I like the- Art, I'm hearing you. Can you be a little bit louder and I'll see if I can increase my volume. We call it stimulus change. Yep. But, but, but the piece missing in terms of our training is us centering ourselves. Not to hijack this presentation because it's amazing. But um but the we we don't get trained to center. And I think that's a crucial piece. Yeah, and to center under pressure. The thing, the, 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 the challenge of using mind, traditional mindfulness practices and yoga and things like that is that nobody's trying to hit you in the head. So the, the benefit of a martial art that was designed to change how conflict works, so it's not I do as much damage to you as quickly as possible, but to preserve the attacker, but to also redirect them, which I'm describing Aikido, of course. The, the benefit of a martial art like that is that you get to practice over and over and over and over what I will do when I'm attacked so that I preserve my balance and my safety. I preserve the attacker while I'm borrowing their balance. And rather than breaking them or sticking them with a the knife or bashing their head, I'm finding a place for them to land 
so that we can have the conversation in a way that neither one of us has, is damaged from doing that. And um, the, same, the same thing can be achieved psychologically, but the problem as far as the Aikido world is concerned is that um, our, our identity as martial artists is so fixed that we don't do the thing that every martial artist knows is required, which is practice the behavior that you want to be able to deploy under pressure so that that's actually what happens when you are attacked. You, we, we do it physically, but we don't do the psychological and the verbal parts of it because there's a taboo against that in society. We're not supposed to talk about conflict. We're just kind of supposed to you know, endure it or triumph and dominate. And that's not, most of the time, that's not very helpful. How are we doing so far? I don't, what time is it? I should have put that here. Um, Brandon, I, I think yeah. also, uh, I think also it's, uh, it's partly the role of Atemi when you just distract the attention, not yep. for hitting, but just to derive and orient the attention in another direction. Just the yep. time, put yourself in safe place or in a better position. Yeah, I found uh, this, and this is um, a little psychological experiment I did. Um, striking, my, striking my own body, Moving my hands as though it were a strike. It doesn't even have to be in their face necessarily, but doing anything that's obviously a purposeful choice of some kind physically can often completely redirect and change the circumstances of what's going on. I can say, golly gee, and you know, whack myself, and the other person suddenly goes, whoa, there's whacking going on, and suddenly their, their attention changes, and they realize, they realize that something else is, is, is up. There's more going on than they thought, and suddenly they're involved in thinking about the process. Sometimes it's by way of the door of their own safety. They're worried that I'm, you know, I might be a little erratic or something. But most of the time, what I'm interested in is um, derailing the idea that we're headed toward a physical conflict in which one of us is the winner and the other suffers. I want to derail that. And I don't derail it with, and now I'm going to be the winner, which is the thing you're taught in almost every other martial art. I derail it with, what the heck is going on? Let's find out. You know, what's going on for you? Uh, just, what does it feel like? So I, I, one guy in a, one guy in a, a, a BART train was uh, about to fight with another guy. Um, they were standing right over this little old lady who was like, a, it had the black shawl and the whole Eastern European grandma thing going on. And they were yelling and screaming at each other and pushing each like right on top of her. And I went, I went and stood between them and said, what's going on? And looked back and forth at them like this. And they looked at me and one guy cursed at me and told me to mind my own business. And I said, yeah, I can see why you'd say that. And I nodded and just stood there. And I said, it feels really weird. I started describing them how it felt to watch them do this. It feels really weird to see you pushing each other and yelling at each other right over this woman who is very much, much smaller than you. Does, it, does that feel strange to you? And they knew at that point they weren't going to get rid of, rid of me and that I wasn't gonna do the usual thing, and I wasn't telling them to stop or hitting them or anything. I was just, what an odd situation we find ourselves in. And we're gonna keep feeling ourselves in this odd situation until it changes, and it's not gonna be my me going away, so what should we do? And they were both, both extremely angry with me, and then they went away. And I thought, you know, okay. You know, I mean, I guess I risk the possibility that they'll wait for me when I get off the train, but it is what it is. I didn't want grandma to get smushed. No smushing grandma. Yeah, no smushing grandma. And and when I worked with I worked with a, a psychiatric nurse for a while, who was going into a locked circumstance in which the time it would take her to extract herself from a circumstance was going to be was going to be much longer than the time it would take for someone to do her serious damage. And she was working with people that were not in control. She's a relatively large woman, but still, she's working with men and women who are not in control of their own behavior and are having extreme psychological states. And her question was, what can I do so that I'm not harmed and I don't have to go home with the memory? Of calling for can I do? I said, um, you can practice and give up the idea that you're going to get out of this unscathed so that you're really serious about it and you make real decisions about whether you want to be there every day or not. And then if the answer is yes, Practice and practice and practice because what you're doing is a martial art. They are going, someone's going to attack you with who knows what, what intention and you'll need to deal with that physically. And not have 
to wait for someone else to come out. They have more time. You don't. You need to have physical self-defense skills, which we can work on. But you also have to decide whether you want to be in this fight every day. Do you work for you know, an organization that helps you to take care of your safety? Um, maybe the protocols need to be changed. Can they do that? But that's also a fight you'll need to have because they want to, they'll want to keep doing the things they already decided on, which endanger you. So you got to decide what fights you want to have and then have them and say, this is a fight. Let's, let's, let's argue. But then we need to change the way things are because I'm not safe right now. And that's your liability as much as anybody else's. So let's, let's work on that. You can't just be silent and wait to see what happens because you'll end up, you know, in the hospital. So let's not do that. And so I've, I worked a little bit with emergency room nurses and a little bit with a couple of doctors, though they have the, the dilemma of thinking they know everything most of the time. And I just, I, I'm not sure what to do a lot of the time. And sometimes the, that ignorance is what brings us to the training. And it's also what brings us to a place where we can really do something about stuff that needs to change. I don't know what's happening. It feels very uncomfortable. What should we do? Is a different proposal than, you know, stop that you or I'll do things to you. It's, it just doesn't, threats don't really work for us a lot of the time. So, so where are we? What needs, to, what needs to happen and what, what else do we need to say? So I have a question. Maybe you could talk a little more with it or explore it a little more. But in the example you gave using your system, I'll call it a system. Yeah. Um, the first well, thing, I mean, you came up and you talked about, you know, we talk about getting centered or being relaxed, like a lot of the arts, um, you know, the mindfulness stuff, but you have nobody attacking you. And it is breathing, learning to breathe abdominally versus learning to breathe in your chest, which unbalances you. So that physiological piece. But what's interesting is I, I found it interesting when you said exhale, breathe out, and then, you know, in a relaxed way, put your hand up which is counterintuitive to when somebody's in that fight or flight syndrome. If they don't have a skill set, if they haven't developed that, the natural tendency is to go. <sighs> and so that's, that's important. It struck me because you obviously you've got to develop that ability to do that first with repetition, but then put it in a stress situation where they actually begin to, to do it and it becomes a different behavior. So talk a little more about that initial thing when you want people to, you know, center through the breath physiologically. Yeah. Um, well, I would like to suggest that all of the behaviors that will be helpful down the road um, when we have some mastery of them, have a first step to take associated with them. And that when I realize it would be really helpful for me to be able to do X under attack, but that I really don't feel like I can do it under attack, um, I ask, well, if you were in a dojo um, and you weren't under attack, but the purpose was to practice being under attack, um, your sensei would say, well, why don't we do parts of it instead of all of it? Why don't we do it um, while we're, we're totally relaxed and not under attack, and then let's increase the amount of stress that you're under. So you see when that breaks down. And the point of a dojo, which we are now in, because we've declared it so, is that we're studying how, how we work with, con with conflict as our context. So um, if I have difficulty breathing out under stress, I could check when I'm completely relaxed and not under stress, do I have difficulty breathing out? And if the answer, is no, great, I'm, I've begun. And then I'm gonna look for opportunities, also because I'm a little bit of a training freak, to try and to see when breathing out becomes difficult for me. It's like uh, working with a break in your voice. I tell my singing students, it's like, when, especially when you're a teenage boy, there's an uh, and, and if you sing, if you sing through it over and over again when you're not performing, you make the chance of it happening when you're performing much less and less likely. It's the same kind of break. So what martial arts do, if your teacher is, is um, good, is they um, set you up for increasing levels of stress so that the bits of things you've learned when you're not under stress can be integrated and deployed when you are. And the same thing is true of the breath trick, is that I'm gonna, next time my child disobeys me in a way that puts them in danger, I'm going to breathe out as I move my body toward them to keep them from harming themselves. And if I can't remember to do it in that amount of stress, 
maybe the stress would be I'm about to lose a board game and that's what triggers me. Okay, the next time I'm about to lose a game, I'll start trying to, I'll find the place where I can take that first step up onto that level of practice and then I'll do my best to keep on moving up the steps from there. It's the conscious choice to do the practice to learn how to do conflict well that changes everything. Checking in again. Is there anything else we need to ask or say? Um, where are we? And can someone tell me what time it is? Three, uh, I guess in your area, 2.47. Okay, thank you. 13 minutes, about 13 minutes till the hour. All righty, thank you. Well, will someone agree to be timekeeper and tell me when it's um, like 10 minutes to the hour and then five minutes to the hour? I need a, an audible response. I'm not seeing nods and things at this time. Please say your name and say, yes, I will be the timekeeper. Rochelle proposed herself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It won't help me if your audio is not on. <laughs> okay. My, my touch screen is, is a little wonky, but yes, Rochelle, no Rochelle will be the timekeeper. Thank you. So um, martial nonviolence is a whole system based on Aikido that goes through and pairs language with technique. So you're learning a physical self-defense technique that has hidden in it all kinds of themes and um, capacity that you, it's, it's gauged so that you, you didn't know that you couldn't do that until you tried it and went, wow, that's kind of hard. And then you, you, there's Japanese names to the techniques that you can use or not use. Um, but when we do our work together, I line up the techniques with scripts so that not because not because there's some universal law that those words must go with the technique. But the reason that I put them with that technique is because I, when I was working with my Aikido students, their physical technique improved when I had them think or speak using those particular ideas. Um, so I've, I've taken all of the basic Aikido curriculum. I've lined it up with the language for the basic scripts. And we go through a series, a three-part series, where we move in silence to work on the physical part of it, because that's what we've neglected for a long time in the modern world. And then we add language, the basic script, and we let the technique be in motion. Um, well, sometimes that's called ki nonagari, which means the spirit, the, the, the key, the, the energy flows. We keep the, keep the person moving. And then we do a third phase in which we combine everything into a now. So it looks more like a martial technique, um, the, the words are improvisational and more like what you would really say. And we go through that three-part learning process over and over and over and over again until understanding conflict as an opportunity to train using your thinking, your speaking, and your physicality becomes the way you think about conflict. And someone well, attacking you in, the way. in any way steps into a dojo with you and, they don't, and then you demonstrate from that point forward. I'm sorry, what was the question? I said 12.50, by the way. All right, Thank you. Your time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, could you perfect. But no, I'm listening. It's great. Brandon, yeah, could perfect. you give a, could one example of, of all these techniques to just realize concrete manner? Sure. For sure. Um, uh, there's a, a, a the, one of the most basic and widely practiced Aikido techniques is called Taino Henko. Um, the Aikido people will know what I mean, but it looks very much like this. You offer your hand, so it goes toward the midsection of the person who is coming towards you to attack you. So they have to deal with that before they get to you. You put your hand out. The person who's coming grabs, and then making a sort of a basket shape with your arms, using the, all of the, across the, the muscles in the middle of your back, you reach out, and you do the same thing with your foot that you do with your hand. So you make a sort of basket shape, and you close your foot. Your weight's on the back leg as though you were going to kick with the front foot. So you go from standing to a sort of a basket shape, and then you take your weight, you take it over your knee, and that turns you while they're attached to you, which takes them off their center, and they lose their balance. And then you turn, and you face the same way they're facing. So you offer your hand, make a basket shape, do the same thing with your foot that you're doing with your hand, like a little lever, and then you swing your balance around so that it takes the other person's balance. And after we've done that, the, we go through the three part, the three part steps. So you do it slowly. So you see all the structure of it and you can check your own balance. You're focused on yourself and you're silent. Then you focus on the other person and whether when they grab you, 
you keep connected to their center and they really lose their balance. You do it in motion and they grab your wrist and say, you're wrong. And as you turn, you say, I'm listening, keeping their, their motion moving. And in the um, third version, they may successfully grab you. You may grab them back instead. It looks like more like a marshal. They're really trying to grab you and hold on to you. They might speak or not speak. But what they're going to say is something that has the archetypal core of your wrong. They're going to attack your rightness in some way. And you're going to choose to speak or not speak, but you're going to do it in a way that continues the motion of their thought as it continues the motion of their body. Does that make sense? Is that as, does that make sense as an, as an example? So obviously, there's no requirement in a real conflict to say, I'm listening, when they grab you and tell you you're wrong. But just the just the scripting of that of putting those ideas together rather than no you're wrong which is i don't know about you but is my natural inclination i do a counterintuitive move that not only has a physical a physical expression but has an a verbal and psychological commitment to choosing things that are not my usual responses so that sets up a learning experience so the next time someone tells me i'm wrong there's a part of me that smiles inwardly because ah Ah, I know what to say when you say that. I have at least two options, the usual stereotypical one and this other one that I've been practicing. And then I start to think creatively about it and it becomes an acting exercise. If there were someone, an ideal observer watching me, what would their experience be of this conflict? Would it be conflict done well, TM, or would it be the usual thing where they kind of go, ah, and they wait for it to be over because obviously those folks aren't doing very well. And what I'm wanting is their imagination to be sparked. I'm wanting them to think, what was that? In the same way that like, lots of my Aikido students saw me do something with somebody, either in an Aikido demonstration or even on the street a couple of times, and they came in and said, what was that you did? And that's what I'm wanting. I'm wanting that, that teacher catch, that you said the thing in class. My psychology students come back and say, it wasn't part of class, but there was a conversation and you said such and such to so-and-so. And, -so, and is that you or did, that, did you get that from somewhere else? And they immediately begin to interrogate me about this thing that interested them. And so I'm really wanting partnership in the process of turning conflict into a learning experience. But the change I'm wanting in the world is that I would like us to have the expectation that it's not appropriate to be in a leadership position unless you're good at this already. You don't have to be a master. You don't have to be, you know, dazzling, but you should at least, I mean, I wouldn't hire anybody to, to run my organization if they couldn't read a spreadsheet or create a budget. Why in the world would I hire them if their management style is Trumpian? You know, what, that I smash you, I threaten you, I, I, I threaten the, the people of your state or I won't give you ventilators because you weren't nice to me. I mean, re really? So, I would like for it to be something that is so commonplace, like accounting, that people will say, yeah, well, what's your, what's your, you know, what's your conflict rating? What's, are, are you a conflict professional? Are you ready to be in this, are you ready to be in a leadership position? And they're identical because leaders that have no conflict skills are a threat to themselves and to the people they work with. And we can see that literally now, unfortunately, um, but it's always been true. Um, just a question of how much of a threat. And I just, I don't think that's, we're so much smarter than that. It's 12.55 or 2.55, your time. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me stop. Um, at, at, at the hour, we're going to call this done, but I'm going to leave, I'm going to stay. And if we have some questions after that, I'm, so, I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, leave the recording running and to answer questions and to stuff like that. But um, the next five minutes is for anything that needs to happen. Uh, to be able to call it closed, any absolutely burning question or something that you, you really disagree with, I may not be, to answer, not be able to answer it this time, but I'd be more than happy to hear it. And if you don't think of it now, send me an email and we can deal with it next session. There's all kinds of options. The floor is open. Just, just one thing um, came to mind while you were telling this, that I, I could define conflict done bad when I act without having the choice of what I'm doing. Yep. That's definitely one of the things that leads to conflict done poorly. I just, um, for me, and this is, this seems, uh, for somebody who's involved in psychological research and teaching graduate school and stuff like that, I, I get in trouble for this a lot, but this is the martial arts part of me. 
Um, I, I want to turn to the person after I've had a conflict with them. They had a difference with me and they came after me about it. And I want to hear from them. Actually, that was pretty good. I don't want to hear from them. Yeah, no, it's fine. Fine, whatever. Because that means it's coming back. The conflict is coming back. It's just a question of how and when. My big reason for not hurting other people, although I like to imagine myself in a very uh, altruistic light, is I want the conflict to be actually over. I don't want a visit from the cops. I don't want a visit from their family or their brother. I don't want to have to deal with it again next week. I want the issue resolved. And I want them to have liked how we did it so that they would come back to me with another issue later should they have it. Because otherwise, we're foreclosing the opportunity of addressing things that are actually pretty simple to resolve if only we would actually work on it together. Yeah. You, one question more. You, we always see conflict as somebody is attacking me, somebody is judging me. But what I see in organization now, people si seem to be, I have to be human, I have to be kind. And then you have people who are just abusing of the kindness of some leaders, managers, just for the simple reason they don't have time to react. They have their own job and doing this kind of talk. And so that's why I like the fact that you add Marshall in it, because sometimes we need to just wake up and just organize the conflict so that I can solve the problem. And I, I think it's more often this, the case and in not so often addressed this kind of way of doing. Yeah, I personally, because I'm sort of naturally aggressive, I have a little difficulty um, equating organizing the conflict with taking over. Um, and I, sometimes, because I'm, I'm in such in the habit of being a teacher, um, or an executive or ma making decisions, I, I begin to act as though it's my job to govern the process when I haven't actually got permission to be sensei or professor or whatever. And I, um, my, part of my practice is to do my very best to, to allow as much space as possible to not be in charge, but to ask leading questions that get our imagination so engaged with the problem that we jump on it together with equal weight and power. Um, because I, yeah, that's just, I'm just projecting, I have, I have a problem with, <laughs> I have a challenge when it comes to imagining myself as having the answer, knowing what we should do and imposing that on other people. So um, I know there are many people that would really be benefit from really taking way more responsibility and leadership and all that sort of thing. But I, my personal dilemma is I need to take it back. I need to step back a lot of the time because my habits are very teachy and telly and I, sometimes it's a problem. I relate to that. <laughs> you know, running toward the end of our time, the people we really haven't heard from a whole lot, would you, either of you like to, would anybody who hasn't spoken a whole lot like to bring up a question or uh, make a statement of some kind. So I'm taking that you you know the way to Carnegie Hall, right? <laughs> practice, practice. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. You said you were a singing teacher. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I do know the way to Carnegie Hall. And what I'm hoping is, um, so will everybody else. That yeah, they'll take right? Because the joke works because the metaphor is real, right? There's a literal way to Carnegie Hall, and there's a metaphorical way to Carnegie Hall. And if you don't do both, you're screwed. <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I had to break it out. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's awesome. Absolutely. I, jokes. I'm a yeah, fellow jokes. musician as well, but. <laughs> yep. So. Okay. I'll be as quiet. European, I don't understand this joke. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, what's a, what's a, uh, What's a good okay. uh, uh, thing? Christian? <laughs> Christian? Yeah. A yeah. man walks up to you on the street and says, do you know the way to the opera? And you say, yes, practice, practice. <laughs> OK, there we go. I, I was trying to think of like, like a fancy concert hall. I, 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 know, I know another one. Do, do, do you know the way? to hospitals yes just close your eyes and cross the street <laughs> <laughs> that was a great one christian i like that one yeah 
Is there anything else we need to say before we call it done and move into social time? Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your being here. Anyone watching? Um, Christian is about to tell us a little bit about his work and we're gonna have a kind of a general conversation about stuff. So now's the time to sign off if you're not interested in that, but I would recommend that you give him a moment to tell you a little bit about what he does. Yeah, I'm excited. Like Let's yeah, go. so thank you. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm busy for 10 years now. My full job is just, I, I developed a kind of similar never the same but it's similar approach called aikicom for aikido communication and i speak about martial kindness so we are very very in the state in the same mood and it's about kind of how to handle communication conflict and and all these kind of things based on aikido nlp neuro linguistic programming nonviolent communication so it's a kind of bunch and um, and and just as I want to, to make it wider, it, because alone, I cannot change the world alone. I, I just started now a few, a few years ago, an association called Applied Aikido that just, just devoted to just find any kind of good approach like Brandon's approach that are just proposing people, non-Aikidoist people, the way to apply Aikido principles, values, and also movement, so embodied and mind, mind and body together, so that we can really induce, invite the people to discover the wonderful way of doing of Aikido that is non-violent by essence, but, marked, but still martial. That's it. Beautifully said. And where would they go to find out more about your work, please? My website is aikicom.org in English and appliedaikido.org for the association. Thank you. Does anybody else have a, a, a question they'd like to ask or a statement they'd like to make or would they like to engage somebody other than me and saying, hey, what's up, what do you do? Or we could tell names and what we do, there are all kinds of options. And I'm gonna step back and not be in leadership for a bit. So anybody that wants to go, go. So, uh, so Brandon, I, I have a question for you, and maybe, you know, I, I've worked with Christian, met him, I'm, I'm, I'm an Aikidoka too, and some of the ways, and an educator, so I cross over that way, and in and, and ways of trying to bring um, the art off the mat, and to get people to understand these principles, um, I find that the challenge, especially with academics, and people with more sophisticated Western knowledge is they uh, need to be anchored in some kind of theoretical position. And so in my own search, as I understand my Aikido practice, the, the tremendous contribution is the somatic piece that's left out of Western learning. And so I'm always trying to say, you know, like you were showing how to partner that movement, the meaning of that movement with a word or a concept in a theoretical model. Christian and I always go back and forth. And so in your work and what you've done, and you said you're in academia too and psychology, have you found some uh, historically psychological or philosophical models that align with what you're trying to do with the language and the metaphor and stuff? Yeah, that's, well, that's why I was asked to teach at my alma mater, which is called Pacifica Graduate Institute. There is a somatic psychology department there um, that's part of the larger movement of somatic psychology. Uh, one of the, the organizations on this side of the pond is uh, the United States Association of Body Psychotherapists. Uh, and um, there are conferences and all that sort of thing. And there's a tremendous amount of research, um, obviously uh, not as big as it will be 10 years from now and uh, way larger than it was 10 years ago. But there's a really significant amount of both qualitative and quantitative research that directly refers to this. So um, yeah, I taught, I taught all levels of graduate students, including those going into their dissertation. Um, and what I was asked to bring was the peace practices, the internationally funded project um, that I've been directing in California um, and to demonstrate how it's basically somatic psychology applied to problems in the real world that are both international, na national, local and familial and internal. So we just, we went through the various stages and showed the, the, the way that that is structured as a psychological project. And the, um, 
the really strong contribution um, um, in the psychological field is, is mostly in the area of Jungian studies and post-Jungian studies. So um, the archetypal psychology, for example, is really strong in showing the connection between uh, archetypal body states and um, uh, applications for conflict and um, emergency response and things like that. Uh, so there's a really, there's a direct con con continuity between the martial traditions, especially the Chinese and the Japanese martial traditions and um, the current understanding of somatic psychology. And somatic is the word that pulls it all together. Right. Because yeah, the, the, it's, a, it's from the Greek word soma, which just means body as it's understood whole, rather than body as opposed to mind, which is a Cartesian um, thought I experiment. Find, I find going, some of the things I'm finding going forward, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but especially I work with the medical community too. They're looking for applied things because, you know, in, in Western science, my, my perception is, you know, what we've gotten to is a model that medicates you, medicates you, it, it deafens the body. And where Eastern science is saying, how do you let the body heal itself and work? So the language just connect is there. But, uh, and, and so a lot of times in the psychological field, I've been very impressed with, uh, you know, the move towards positive psychology, which is building capacities and competencies versus looking at deficits. And I ran across uh, a, terminology that's kind of a new field but it's called salutogenesis have you heard that i have i don't know anything about it but i have heard about it and let's bookmark this too i mean i'm not saying you should stop but i'm saying no. there, uh, there's um i i positive psychology like any system has its dilemmas as well as its uh as, as well as its uh contributions right and uh, I, I would love to offer you a critique of positive psychology that doesn't undermine its positive aspects um, uh, or you could just compare it to depth psychologies um, uh, and, and see the dilemmas of positive psychology is that it's the, it, very briefly is that it's in general industrial as opposed to humanistic and that it um, has a very progressive uh, mindset that makes it very difficult to deal with the reality of suffering. So um, I, I, we can talk more about that another time, but I just wanted to let you know that that's an op if you want to follow up with me on that, I'd love to talk about it. Yeah, I'd be interested. Just, I just, I have to find, I have to leave because it's late here in Europe. Um, just if you are interested, I am tomorrow at one hour before than yours. Now, I'm offering a, a kind of a similar way of to practice. I called it "How can we apply Aikido in communication in this lockdown period?" If you're interested, so, you want to come, of course. Let me let me say what I think you said. Let me let me repeat what I think you said to make sure that it's clear. I started at 2 p.m. Central Time today. This is Wednesday, the 1st of April. And you're saying tomorrow, Thursday, the 2nd of April, you're going to do a webinar or a meeting of some kind at 1 p.m.? Yeah. My time, Central Time? And when, where would they go to find access to that? I put, I put the link in the conversation in the chat, in the chat zone now. But, okay, okay. But can you, can you say... Is there, a, is, there, is there a URL you could say aloud that someone could follow to go and see, to sign up for that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I published it on the website appliedaikido.org and also on the Facebook page called Applied Aikido. So you Great. find the event on Facebook. Thank you so much and have a lovely evening. And I really appreciate you being here. Yes, me too. It was very pleaseful. Yes. Bye-bye. Please come back. I will. Now, Brandon, are you going to continue to have these about the same time, or are you going to build on it? Right now, it's looking like all central time. It's looking like 8.30 Monday night, maybe, was going to be good, because I'm having, I'm getting a lot of requests from overseas and from different time zones. Right. So it's probably 8.30 Monday night, going to be middle of the day on Wednesday. I'm looking at 2 o'clock. It's a pretty good time for us right now, um, central. And, I'm, and Saturday morning, probably 9.30, something like that on a Saturday morning. That okay. way we get... We get almost we get almost all the time zones not too extreme, right? And I'm trying to handle. I'm trying. To, I'm going to try to cover some of the same areas for those of the three classes during the week, and then move on after that. Well, I've done some things over the last couple of years with Christiane and with uh, you know, uh, Ike Extensions, but I'm with the PDI, Peace Dojos. Yeah. And uh, so we've been meeting, you know, with European people at three o'clock on. The last Wednesday of the month, the three o'clock gives them about nine o'clock. So that's a good time. And that would be two o'clock your time. 
So yeah. keeping it, like you said, in that frame, Christiane has a number of people in Europe that are very much connected. So if you go to his website, uh, Applied Aikido, you'll see some of the people that are designated on there. And, and so there's a community being formed. So like we say, having that time be right for them on another day, like when Monday is nothing, you know, for us. So that that would be good. We're trying to build a calendar of these different people so people can – connect to those. So that's really good. It's good to know that central time. Thanks. Yeah. I've just spoken with uh, Christian about that. And, uh, and um, obviously I've been part of IK extensions for a really long time. And right. thanks for bringing it up. I really appreciate it. And I'll follow up with him on that. Okay. Rochelle and Ria. What do Hi. you do? What do you do? You want to start Ria? Oh, she's muted. Uh, we work as behavior analysts, Okay. Uh, behavior specialists with a, uh, Adults who have uh, developmental disabilities who are not neurotypical per se. And we kind of are the positive kind of liaisons before. You're on mute, sweetie. Take yourself off mute. You're on mute. <laughs> so we're kind of the last line before people are kind of. I don't want to say given up on, but the, the, into state institutionalized, incarcerated, or they're institutionalized. Yeah. So okay. That's that's who we are. So are you are you in the mid mid part of the United States? Are you in Texas or around there? We're in California. Oh, We're you're in, in California. California. So you know Brandon from his California days. I know Brandon because my son trained in Aikido at Brandon's okay. dojo where Brandon studied. Okay. And I just met Brandon today, so. Okay. So you all are based in California. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, originally from Louisiana, but you know, we're, okay. we're, we're there. It's probably good not to be in Louisiana right now, right? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> but so yeah, that's what we do. Well, Rhea still does. I am venturing off into being a young people and trying to figure out what I'm doing. Are you calling me old? No. Just kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. What's your story? Yeah, what's oh, your story? I'm, like, I'm near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on the East Coast. And uh, I've met Brandon a couple times when I came out to the West Coast for Ike Extension conferences and have kind of followed him. And then he moved to Texas. And then Christiane and I talked, and we always said, we've got to get with him because now he's in the middle part of the country. You know, like uh, Paul Linden's in, in uh, Ohio, get these anchoring people that want to connect and get together, you know, and just find a way that we keep supported. Because there's a lot of change going on, especially with what's happening now. And people have to begin to look at their own self and practice. Opportunities could open up, you know, for uh, professionals and non-professionals. I've been impressed with professionals. I was at a... a a Zoom meeting with 300 people. Uh, Brandon, do you know Mark Walsh? Yeah. Well, Mark has been doing things around the yoga community and that. And it was really interesting uh, a couple of weeks ago, losing track of time, do about two of these a day. It's really amazing. But uh, all these people there that all of a sudden, because of the way the world is, their physical practices are shut down. So how do you still connect? How do you maintain? So the Aikido community is doing that. People are doing videos, what you're doing live, or making practices available. And um, so I've, done, I've got a couple of virtual dojos going with our adults and our kids. And it's really interesting. Once you get over the hurdle of uh, the technology and they're motivated to get in, uh, something I saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, Miles Kessler did a big thing for Aikido. Is somebody came up with the term uh, virtual intimacy. We're social beings, we still need to connect. And it's amazing, like you're saying, people taking the leadership, like yourselves, to stand up and just connect people. I see my kids, I check in with them during the week, and then we have Saturday and Sunday classes. And so I'm seeing them. And I said, call me up if you need it. You know, give me an email, how you doing? But just that touching really helps them understand and look at themselves. So I think that's great, you know? Of course, now in medicine, they're talking about telehealth, right? So the whole idea of looking at how do we connect with people. So I think it's great opportunities now. 
It is. It, it's very interesting. This, what an odd time to be a human being. It is. It is an odd time. It's. Uh, yeah. A lot of interesting opportunities, but uh, but a time for of collective suffering uh, never fails to put us uh, in a different frame of mind than the usual daily busyness. Right. David Brooks wrote an interesting article in the Atlantic the other day about comparing what we're doing now to the Blitz. Uh, contrast. Oh, I saw that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, I, you talk about metaphors. You see the metaphors have been coming up about war and trying to mobilize people. And then the warrior, the warrior. We've got to be strong. We've got to support each other, community. So these things percolate up at times when you get in people's face and said, you know, you can't do what you've always been doing because it's dangerous. So, uh, yeah. But again, how do you offer the language to people, the fear that initially go through? And I, uh, uh, in answer to your question, I describe what's going on and I make a proposal. There you go. I mean, that, that's really good, that whole uh, uh, kind of protocol that you use. It's a place to start no matter what. At least that's what it's designed to be. Now, does that come out of a particular theoretical position? Just research and experience. Okay. Yeah, is that uh, um, there's a call and response aspect to consciousness itself um, that's embedded in the narrative tradition of how we've always organized our brains and uh, our, as human beings and how we. Sorry, sorry, so, sorry I'm muted. Mostly has to do. It mostly has to do with um, studying what what when something goes well, what happens, what 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 did they do when it went right. well. Um, and the most, one of the most universal patterns I've ever seen, especially in the people I really admire, is that um, description happens and then proposals are made. And those are the two sort of prerequisites. Because if you don't, if, some, if nobody gets the chance to describe what's going on, um, then the proposals are not only going to be askew, but there's going to be that feel like, nah, then we really aren't really doing something about what's really going on. And it turns out that's psychologically that's because the, the 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 ritual of describing something to yourself or to other people is the thing that sat, that that fixes it in consciousness as the thing we're working on. So we're not working on something, and we're certainly not working on something together unless it's been described. You and know, so psychologically, you hook you, especially an attacker who doesn't realize that you have skills, you hook them into the process of redirection by describing the thing instead of just freaking out about it. Well, something popped in my mind, but you were, and, you, and you're using the, the analogy of the philosophy behind Aikido, which is different. But you were asking before, how could people look at our leadership now and support that? You know, that's be tough and all. And that comes out of our illusions, right? Our narrative. And if the narrative is never challenged, we, we form communities that enable that narrative to continue. And that's what I'm saying. It's got to get to a point of a crisis or a confrontation that we create a new narrative, or at least we're open to it. That's that's one of the ways that it could work. But I'm also aware that um, for all my system making, to which I am addicted, um, I there's a mysterious quality to how we choose what we do as human beings. Otherwise, there would be no concept of the unconscious, for instance. And we destroy ourselves um, frequently for no obvious logical reason. We just do. We make choices that are self-destructive or sometimes that are amazingly productive and we don't, we don't have any idea. Right. Why, why did I do that? I don't know. How did it work out that way? And sometimes it's just the answer is hidden in the complexity of the system. And if you can pull it apart, you can figure out mostly why it happened. But there are a lot of things that we do. People, people, uh, in some in some of the research about the sheer quantity of gun deaths that are that are suicide, um, the studies that have been done, which are are minor in this particular area, but the, the work that's been done in really looking in as much as possible to what the last to what the last days, weeks, months were up to that action, um, a lot of the time it's not it's not clear that there was a reason that other people can understand why the person killed themselves. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's, it's really obvious. It was, you know, a triggered event. But a lot of the time, it seems to be just the acting out of a psychological state that is inchoate. It's not, 
uh, it's not, it can't give itself words. And so it can only come out through action. And uh, sometimes in the physical encounters I've had with people that ended up being, you know, what someone else might think of as a fight, but I thought of as an a chance to practice, is that they didn't make a clear decision that they were going to attack me because it would get X result. They just were in motion all of a sudden. And it was right. very clear from their eyes and from the way their face worked and from what their body did that they, it wasn't a conscious decision at all. They just jumped on me. It was just the time to do that. And um, if you're not open to the fact that you can be self-destructive and, and, da and dangerous to other people, be, that by your decision-making and your voting and what language you choose and what you believe, and if you're not even open to that being a conversation, you're absolutely vulnerable to propaganda, to being manipulated by the systems that are created to manipulate us to buy and vote in particular ways. I think what, what you're saying, what comes up for me in, in my readings of Eastern practices, spiritual practices, one of the big concepts that comes up and the reason for doing that is awareness, to be aware of these triggers and patterns we have. And it's yeah. not external, it starts internal, you know? But you gotta give yourself the space to do that. But how you use your attention is, is a habitual process. You do yeah. you use your attention the way you've habituated yourself to use your attention. Absolutely. And that's, that's why meditation and attentional exercises are a huge part of mindfulness, psychology, and martial arts. It's one of the it's one of the through lines that joins all these practices together and allows me to do liberal performing and and um, process arts all at the same time. It's why that that's why that's those are, those are the parts of the process of martial nonviolence. So one of the other things that pops in my mind, I keep coming back when Christiane and I talk, is the idea of process over time. And I keep finding myself going back to Tuckman's original work on groups, you know, forming, norming, storm, uh, forming, storming, then you got to norm. And yeah. it just seems to me that change comes through social associations and you have to have that vessel, which we call the dojo, right, in the rituals, to get people to stay together long enough that something, another word I popped into the, the, the current literature is coming out, emergence. It's that synchronicity that is allowed to have a group mind, you know, but you got to stay yeah. with it for a while to develop that. You know? yeah. I, and, I, I try to avoid language like you got to have this to get that, but there are certainly, there are certainly certain changes that don't seem to happen without certain um, aspects in place. Uh, right. communal ritual, ritual understanding and the continual ritual practice of something over time right. even if it's everybody getting together and playing the violin at the same time or practicing right. or something, and something I think that that's what you're saying I think that's what this time the technology what's bringing people together just that social connection and yeah. so you know I'm also realizing that we're sort of I'm, I'm hearing you and my voice dominating most of this and I'm wondering if any of the other because I, I need to go away fairly soon and I'm wondering if anybody else wants to say anything, be heard saying anything, or bring anything up. Rochelle, a reaction? Rhea, a reaction to my babbling or Brandon's response? Well, I mean, Freehold found it very, uh, very riveting. Oh, okay, good. We're, we're doing well. Well, I feel validated. Thank you. Yes. Freehold is a uh, tough judge, and so is Bruley. Right, there's another one down here. Oh, good. Fantastic training, Brandon. There's so much yes. of this that we could use in our in our work, and so much that we can teach caregivers and support providers and families. And honestly, you know, we should probably talk about our higher ups, uh, maybe hiring you to teach our rest of our colleagues all this. Absolutely. Yeah, that's kind of the plan. I'm writing this notes right now to send them to. Yes. I've done that. I've done that kind of thing a lot, and I would be more than happy to do it again. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you, Thank Josh. You. Nice meeting you. Take care, Brandon. Nice meeting you. See you next time. Thanks yes. for your time. Uh, so you're looking at this Saturday and next Monday? Yeah. Saturday so and Monday. If you look at the website, um, conflictonwell.com, and you go to the, the classes list, um, okay. it's uh, at 930 and then Monday at 830, I think is what I put on there. Okay. I might miss Saturday because I have my kids then, but I'll see you next Monday. Awesome. awesome. See you then. Take Thank care. You. Bye. Stay Bye. safe. Stay in. You too. Don't get cooties. That's right. That's right. Okay. Bye. Bye.